And good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to another live Art Business Academy Q&A session. Today is Friday, October 9th, 2020. Uh, it is good to be back here with you. Uh, it seems like about a month since our last broadcast. Um, I know it's only been a week, but uh, in the meantime, uh, it, as I mentioned last week, we made the move from back from Pine Top to Scottsdale. Um, and getting back is always quite an adjustment. Um, amazing how things can kind of uh, slip and slide over the course of a summer. Um, I've had computer issues coming back, so you're going to see me staring in weird directions um, as, as we run through this, but we're just going to roll with it and uh, make it work. I've spent uh, the last four days completely rearranging the Scottsdale Gallery, rehanging. Um, we had our first art walk last night, um, our first art walk in seven months, um, in kind of a unique situation where you know, we're having to enforce social distancing and masks and just a, a, a very, um, you know, different landscape than what we had been accustomed to um, with art walks prior to um, uh, all the, the shutdowns. But uh, we had about 100 people through the gallery last night. So um, definitely people are getting out and back and, um, you know, starting to make purchases. And so we'll be keeping up with um, kind of all of that, and I'll be giving you updates. Um, we'll have some things to talk about um, over the next several weeks as, as we see how the season is kicking into gear, what traffic patterns are like, etc. Today, however, we are going to jump in and take um, your questions. And um, as, as usual, I received uh, numerous great questions. I'm going to have a hard time getting to all of them, uh, but I want to get to as many as I can and cover them um, thoroughly yet uh, expeditiously. And so with that, let's jump in and take them. And um, if I've got you here and I pull your question up and you wanna hop in and um, uh, talk to me a little bit more about the question or just give me the question instead of me reading it, I'd love to have you do that. Um, but let's start with a question from Patty. I'm not sure, um, I think I may have Patty here. Uh, this is a question that Patty sent in um, uh, maybe a week and a half ago, um, and it's a it's a good question about um, uh, what to show um, when you're participating in an art festival or even a gallery show, and kind of thinking about the number of pieces that would be ideal. And Patty says, um, I've participated in a couple of shows at a gallery, and I'm getting ready for my first art festival. I've done many craft shows and farmers markets previously, but this is the first time really identifying myself as an artist. In the festival, I only have room to display five small pieces of artwork. Um, in the gallery shows, I've only shown one or two pieces per show. I'm wondering how many pieces minimum of an artist you show in your gallery at one time, small works, in order to make enough of a statement that they stand out. My pieces are not very flashy and I keep worrying that they aren't going to get the necessary attention. And so um, this certainly gets into some important questions um, as we think about display. Um, and it's something um, that's fresh on my mind as I've just spent the last four days rearranging the gallery, thinking about how to draw attention. And I think Patty, um, you're on the right, uh, you're, you're on the right wavelength in thinking about this question of how do I get attention to my work? How important it is, is it? Um, how many pieces do I need to have? How, how strong do those pieces need to be? And certainly we see in the gallery, um, you know, it's just almost um, inevitable that, um, you know, some of the work is going to tend to draw more attention than other. Um, and um, it is also kind of interesting to see how that dynamic can shift as artwork shifts to different parts of the gallery, um, which, you know, as a result of that, we it's not as if we have, um, you know, a dozen equally sized partitions of the gallery where you're gonna get the same amount of space no matter where you move the artist. So there's gonna be a different number of pieces showing, um, a different combination of, of the work showing. Um, and certainly I am then thinking about, um, 
you know, how much space to give each other artist and, and what pieces to display, what order to display them in. Um, you know, typically I will have a grouping of the artists work out, but also some art on reserve in the back. So I, I have choices to make when it comes to thinking about um, how the artwork is going to fit together. Um, you know, and as a gallery owner, um, I get to be a little bit of an autocrat and just, um, you know, decide that uh, and kind of figure it out. And um, uh, in, in some ways, I think that for my artists, that's a good thing because they could probably, and, and I almost do, you could almost drive yourself crazy trying to second guess and think of what that right combination is. Um, and at a certain point, you just have to say, you know, I have the space that I have, I have the artwork that I have, um, I'm gonna get it up and get it out. The most important thing here is exposure and um, if I get enough people, um, hopefully I'll get that, that one person or two people or three people that just it resonates with and I'll get the, the, the sales to happen. Now, um, having said that, um, I don't necessarily spend a lot of time thinking about, um, well, no, that's not true. I do think about kind of the narrative flow of the gallery um, and I, you know, I do want to think about how a client coming into the gallery is going to experience whatever direction they head off in. How are they going to experience the art? And what is the transition from one artist to the next going to feel like? I don't want that transition to be too jarring, um, you know, in terms of having radically different styles next to one another. Um, or, um, you know, one artist who is more subdued and the one right next to it vibrant and, and bold. And so you do tend to think about those things. But, um, you know, if, if you're walking to my gallery right now and kind of do an analysis of the range of work that's showing, you would see a pretty broad range of different styles and intensities and values and contrasts and those kinds of things. And what's interesting is that our clients will respond to those in different ways where we'll get some people who are drawn to the very bold, um, kind of in your face, strong colors work. Um, and, and then others who experience all that work, but then when they come to one of my artists who is more subdued, um, that can be a nice contrast and um, can maybe even help the, the peaceful nature of that work stand out. And so um, I feel like it's it's been good for us to be able to offer some of that contrast. And you as an artist, as you're participating in a show, um, you know, can, can have some of the advantages that come from that. Now, your challenges are that it's likely, um, you know, unless you have a, an organizer for a, an event who is very um, uh, aware and cognizant of the, the narrative flow of the show and it's willing to put a tremendous amount of effort into organizing the placement of each artist, which it, it would just be overwhelming, um, especially if you've got dozens or even hundreds of artists participating. It's just going to be almost logistically impossible to, to spend as much time as I do and get the same kind of flow. And so unfortunately, in those kinds of events, you can end up in a situation where your work is um, being shown amidst other work that is pretty radically different and has, um, you, you know, doesn't have that, that same um, transition that you might hope to have. And that being the case, um, you, to a certain extent, you just have to say, this situation is what this situation is. I am going to focus on putting together uh, you know, whatever space I have, I'm going to focus on showing the pieces that I am most excited about and that I feel work best together. That would be my focus. I would just try and not second guess or think about because you just don't have any control over what else is going on around it. Um, and just really try and think about what, what are my best current works that I have available to me and what can I do among those works to create my own kind of micro environment where the work that I'm showing makes sense together? Um, and, if, you know, if you can do that, um, you, you know, you can hope that as people are experiencing the show that they're going to see your work and that they'll get it, they'll see it. 
Um, I, I am not a fan, and I see a lot of artists do this in these kinds of um, you know, big group events where they kind of think of the shotgun approach. I'm going to show a wide variety of different things in the hopes that something that I'm showing will resonate with someone. Um, and instead, I would really think about, and, and the advantage that you can get is that if you do create a very cohesive, um, very strong grouping of your work, then it's that grouping as a whole that's going to attract people to your work. Um, and, and that hopefully as they get into it, they'll be able to zone out um, the, uh, the other pieces. Now, um, you know, in, in terms of number of pieces, I do like to have um, at, at least four or five pieces on display. Um, and, and for us, that, that means mid to good size pieces on display. I'm, I'm pretty reluctant to have just a single piece of artwork by an artist because then I start to lose that cohesiveness and that narrative. Um, and, and that piece can feel out of place and it doesn't give the viewer any context to kind of compare and contrast with. Um, having said that, there are some situations and I have one situation right now where I only have one piece by an artist. Um, I'm going to be getting some other pieces in, but I went ahead and hung that piece because I do have a spot in the gallery where it can kind of stand on its own. Um, so it's not a, you know, it's not any kind of biblical commandment that I have to hang more than one piece. But generally speaking, I do want a grouping and I want to give as much space. And so, um, you know, definitely something to be thinking about. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, to a certain extent, as you have opportunities to participate in shows and festivals and even gallery group showings, um, you'll pretty quickly learn which of those events seems to be optimized for showing your work. And if there's an event, an annual event, let's say, or a regular repeating event that you, you get into it, you do it once and you say, that just did not work for my art, the way they had it set up, um, the, 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 the space that I had, what I could show and, and how things were put together, it just did not work. And I would cross that show off my list and, um, you know, kind of put it in the past and look for other opportunities or be looking for galleries. Um, and, and, you know, um, uh, hopefully over time you get to optimize that. It does not hurt to try, does not hurt to experiment, um, but ultimately we want to be looking for optimal situations to show your artwork um, where you can get good groupings. And, and again, that's why we're aiming to, to show in galleries. Uh, and so, Patty, if you have more specific questions, and oh, yeah, I see you there, Patty. Good morning. Uh, let's see if I can get you unmuted, and let's see if my audio is working so I can hear you. I don't know if my audio is working. Oh, hold on, Patty. I don't have you. I, I mean, I hear you coming out, but out of the wrong place. Let me see if I can get... Hold on just a second. Nope. It's not going to give me that option. Um, I'm going to take my headphones out. And Patty, let's try that again. Can I hear you now? Uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> Boy, I am in a bad situation here. Hold on. Let me see if I can boost volume somehow. I am at 100%. You guys, I'm afraid today is a one way conversation because I've got no audio coming to me. Um, Hold on one second. I think I've got, let me just. All right, let's try that one more time. Okay, are you there? No. I can, I can. I, it looked like an old man straining. Um, that, that's why, but go ahead, Patty. I think I've got you. <laughs> Well, I did drive myself a little crazy, or I avoided it. I, I could see myself going crazy picking the pieces, and I thought I could have more than five, uh, but in my setup, that's all I have room for. So, uh, But what I'm now driving myself crazy with is I have a bin of other pictures. Should I bring them, or should I... Should I have oh, Patty, the, this is a, a great <laughs> question for shows, the bin, the extra bin, which, um, you, you know, I go back and forth on this a little bit. It, it depends a little bit on the event and the type of people who are attending. And I've had conversations with artists for whom the bin becomes kind of the bread and butter of shows. 
okay. you know, the five pieces attract people in and then the bin gives them the opportunity. Um, you, you know, I think it can be a distraction from selling the originals. But on the other hand, some shows just don't sell many originals. They don't draw the audience that, um, or, or I should say, maybe not originals versus prints, but maybe it's just framed versus unframed, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they're also um, framed. They're all framed. Yeah. I yeah. Know. So, <laughs> you know, um, I, again, this is, this is an area where I say there isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer. Um, to bin or not to bin. Um, rather, I would say that it's worth experimenting um, and seeing what responses are. And, um, you know, at some events, a sale is a sale. And so you take what you can get and, um, you know, that gives you an opportunity to show some more pieces. And, it, you know, it might also give you the opportunity if a piece sells off the wall, now I've got something to replace it with. And right. so um, it could definitely be worth, worth doing that. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, anyone else want to jump in on any of that display groupings? Um, and if not, let me, okay, let's go to our next question. This one is um, a good question on follow up. And, um, you know, as you're approaching galleries, it's inevitable that you're going to be in a situation where you need to do some follow up. Um, and so it says, how do I follow up with gallerists who after receiving my artist seeking representation email say they think my work is right fit for the gallery and after my response, I don't hear back from them. Um, I'd like to know what my next move should, I, should be. Do I keep following up every seven days and what's an appropriate response? Do I say I'll be in the area and set up a visit to their gallery? Um, so, so again, a good question, and one that you know, we're all going to run into this situation where you are going to be having, um, you know, a back and forth with the gallery, and um, uh, ultimately it could come down to this: how do I um, follow up when I've got some indication of interest from the gallery? And I think that um, the the first instinct is correct. Yes, we want to continue to follow up. It doesn't have to be every seven days, um, and in fact, you, I, I wouldn't want it to become you know, kind of a robot response. Um, but I would follow up several times um, and, and kind of maybe in more frequent succession at first, um, you, you know, and then maybe letting it space out a little bit if you're not getting the response. But the idea here to um, uh, kind of give some different communications in the follow up, the first few would be it was great talking to you or I appreciated receiving your email. Um, I'm attaching another copy of my portfolio and would love to follow up on our, our conversation. Um, I, I would um, almost always, in fact, it would be hard for me to think of a reason not to in your follow up, go ahead and attach another copy of that portfolio. Um, there's no reason not to give that to them so that they can have quick reference and a reminder of what your artwork is. Um, and, and then, um, you know, you could also try and stir it up. And, and uh, in my email back, uh, I ask, okay, how close are the galleries? How likely is it that you would indeed be able to go and make a visit? And the response was, they're within 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so yeah, absolutely, you could do that. Or, uh, you know, I might suggest a little bit of a surprise attack and um, go visit the galleries, um, uh, you know, you could ask, I, I'm going to be in the area, could I come and see you? But even if you don't get a response, go ahead and go visit. Um, there's just, we, we've said it again and again here that persistence is going to be the key to your success when it comes to um, uh, establishing relationships with galleries. Um, you know, especially in crazy times like we're in right now with a lot of noise and distractions, it may take some of that additional follow-up and effort. Um, but even in normal times, um, people get busy, and even if they have a positive response, um, they just may need some more prompting. And I will tell you, this is definitely a case of the squeaky wheel getting the grease, where if you um, have a gallery say, oh, I enjoyed receiving your email, looking at your portfolio, I am interested in your work, it could be a fit for our gallery, um, you know, I'd like to, to talk about this further, and then you go into that blank zone, well, if you just let that kind of dissipate and disappear, um, you could have the gallery come back to you, but it's far more likely to happen if, if you do the follow-up. And of course, the fine line that we're walking is um, we, we don't want to become um, that neurotic, uh, you know, uh, obsessed 
gallery owner thinking, oh no, I need to get a restraining order now kind of, of um, artist or that kind of situation. But instead, we just want to keep our, our communication very professional, um, providing additional information, uh, you know, an additional copy of the portfolio, and just let them know, um, you know, we enjoyed that conversation that was getting started by email. Um, we're going to be persistent and professional about it, and um, let, let's go ahead and follow through. Um, and, and we've heard many examples here where it was in the follow-up that the relationship came to fruition. Um, you know, if we give up too easily, we're, we're missing out on those opportunities. So we'll definitely look forward to um, hearing how that follow-up goes. Um, another question about shows, this one from uh, Catherine. Um, I'm planning an ex exhibition at my local art and theater complex. Like to invite local gallery owners. Um, what would you recommend is the best way to do this? Yes, um, and I see I've got Catherine here too, so feel free, Catherine, to hop in if you'd like. But, um, you know, um, certainly it's not a bad idea to extend an invitation. And if the um, organization is, which most of the, I can't imagine why they wouldn't do this, most of the time the organization is going to send out their own email invitation. Yes, um, and so taking that invitation and um, forwarding it with a personal note, maybe at the top. Um, I'm, you know, my, my work is going to be on exhibit. Um, it'd be an honor to have you join us if you're available, something along those lines, just a, a soft invitation. So um, I will tell you that I wouldn't necessarily put a tremendous amount of stock in the likelihood of the galleries attending, um, gallery owners attending. Um, right. The reality is I, I receive um, you know, dozens and dozens of these kinds of invitations every month. And it's just as busy as life is, it's not possible for me to attend even a fraction of them. But yeah. on the other hand, this is not a bad, I mean, first of all, certainly a gallery owner could attend and I do attend art events from time to time. Um, so you haven't lost anything by trying, but even more so um, you're putting yourself on their radar. Um, and you're, you're getting one of those touch points. This is a great um, excuse, if you will, to be in touch and provide information and get, get your name in front of them. And in, you know, in some ways, what this is, is an endorsement of you and your work by that art, arts organization, um, whatever the, the institution is that's hosting the show. And so that's definitely a positive and you wanna take advantage of it. Why wouldn't you pass that invitation on? And I would say, um, you can pass it on not only to local galleries, but um, even galleries that are out of your area. You know that, that the owners are even less likely to attend. But again, you're getting the same benefit um, from having forwarded that along. And boy, um, you know, especially if you can get some photos of your artwork at the exhibit, um, that gives you an opportunity to send a follow-up email. Um, and it could even be a little bit less um, less targeted, less of a specific email to the person, but just a thanks to everyone who attended my show. Um, we had a great event and, and um, here are some images and just kind of again, that, that repetition that can come through those events. Um, if you're participating in an event like this, you would want to take full advantage and get every benefit that you can from that event. And so, um, you know, make sure that you, for sure make that you're getting um, images of your artwork on display, people around your artwork and interacting with it. If you can have someone taking photos of you, talking to clients about your work, um, th those are just great photos to have and can be a huge ancillary benefit to an event like this. Uh, any other questions on that, Catherine, or anyone else on, on shows and events and galleries? Well, it would be it would be a solo show. It would be, it's me hiring hiring the venue, um, and one of the gallery owners I wanted to invite, and um, their gallery is only about a hundred yards away, so that's why I asked the question because sure. When I first went to them a long time ago, it's a few years ago now, they they said to me I showed them my work. I, I was uninvited. I just went in, and they said, "Well, if you put on." a show, then come and see me afterwards. So they're the people I'm really wanting to impress. Sure, yeah. 
Well, yeah, absolutely. Then you definitely want to invite them um, and, and follow up with them. But uh, as I say, um, this is an opportunity to, um, you, you know, take advantage of that with many different galleries. It doesn't just have to be targeted to that one, yes. one gallery. So try and take advantage of it in every way that, uh, that you can. And of course, send us photos as well. We would like to see how the artwork <laughs> looks and how the show comes together as well. Yeah, I, I found that the, um, if they're not operating at the moment, so I've got to wait until they're open again. Awesome. Okay, good. Well, let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep up with you on that. Let's uh, hop over to the next question. This one um, is from Helen. Uh, and again, I, I think I've got Helen here. You've got a question about uh, photos. I won't even bring it up. Let's talk about it. Photos of artwork in clients' homes. Oh, hold on. Should be at, there we go. Can you hear me? Got you now. Okay, yeah. Uh, you've been posting blogs about having us set up a, a, a folder and get pictures of our artwork in clients' homes for use in our portfolio and Facebook and other things. And I do, I've been doing that, not only with new sales, but going back to previous um, customers, clients. And the problem I'm getting is that by half of the photos I get are awful. They'll snap something on their phone and message it to me so it comes in at 71 DPI. Yeah. Despite the fact that I usually say, I'd love to have you in the photo, almost no one is doing that. Now, yeah. the way I'm phrasing the question is, it would be very exciting for me to see how you use this artwork in your home. I haven't said, I'm going to put it on Facebook or in my portfolio. Would that help? What do, how do I phrase this request so that I get a good photo? Yeah, it's it's a delicate proposition, right? Because um, you know, if if we make too much of it, I'm going to share it on social media and put it on my website. Um, you know, we may be scaring our customer away. Our our um, shy customer may be less likely um, to to um, follow through and, and send the photo to us. Um, the way we've done this is, um, and 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 because of that, where you, you know, kind of not overemphasizing, we assume that a client knows if they're sending us a photo. I mean, we're a gallery, they're sending us a photo. Um, they've got to assume that we're going to be using it. And in fact, the way we kind of handle this most of the time is that um, we'll ask, can you send us a photo of the piece in your space? We'd love to share it with um, the, the artist. We can say that, right? You can't say it as much because you are the artist. But we also say, we would love to be able to share this photo with other clients who are considering this artist's work. Um, and, and by saying it that way, um, what we're doing is we're kind of asking them to help us promote the artist's work to other potential clients. Um, and, and so it, to, to, to us, and to, in my way of thinking, that feels a little less um, like we're saying, hey, if you send us a photo, we're gonna plaster it all over social media and um, you know, put images of your house out there everywhere. Um, even though in reality, we are going to put it on social media where we are going to try to encourage other clients to be interested in that artist's work. And that is one of the ways that, that we're going to be using it. But it just, you know, it, the, the wording definitely matters. Um, now, what we've done in the past um, to kind of help with the um, quality question, because you're right, it definitely can be an issue. And some of the photos we've received um, are, are next to unusable. Um, now, there have been some things that have helped over the years, and one is that people's smartphone cameras are becoming better and better and better, mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, um, it's almost becoming harder to take a bad photo thanks to the advances in technology, so that's been nice. Um, Second, um, if we can, uh, if we send the invitation via email, and, and, you know, we will even explicitly say, uh, if you could reply to this email and send us the photo as an attachment, that prevents it from being texted to us, um, where th th that is one of the biggest degraders of image qualities if they're sending it through a text message or something like that. And so if, you know, if, if we specifically say that we want it via email, we're more likely to get it that way. Now, for us, maybe it is a little easier because that's almost the only way we communicate with people. It's rare that we would ever have any uh, mobile device communication with a client. Then the other thing we do 
is we will send some example photos that, uh, that clients have sent to us. And you can bet we're picking the best examples that we've gotten that kind of give you an idea that show other cl you know, clients in the photo with the artwork that show how to frame the artwork in, you know, don't cut, pe cut part of the artwork off or put a couch in front of it or, you, you know, all the things that um, clients don't tend to think about as much as we do. Um, and so by showing them some examples, that can really be helpful. And if you need to for your example photos that you're sending to them, um, if you don't have great photos, stage your own, um, you know, uh, set up some, set up a piece of your artwork invite a couple friends in to come and stand by the artwork with smiles on their faces and, and snap a photo <laughs> and use that as an example. Um, you know, and you might need specific directions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, here's what we found get, provides the best results. If you can take the photo um, during the, the, you know, the, the brightest part of the day or with the lights turned on and, and, you know, watch out for shadows and, um, you know, try and click. Now, obviously not everyone's gonna follow those instructions and, and that, but if you, you, you know, the more we can do to help provide that kind of um, instructional information and give them a sense of what it would take to get a good photo, the more likely we are to get it, um, you know, to get what we want. Now, the other thing I will say is that we don't necessarily have a cut and paste form email that we send to clients asking for these photos. Because we do want these kinds of communications to be very personalized. And, um, you know, I want my, the, the, the salesperson who worked with the client is going to have the best idea of kind of the level of formality in the conversation, um, you, you know, in any particular details we want to ask for or add into the email. And so really, we just kind of take those elements of, um, you know, a couple sample photos and some instructions and kind of put together our own custom email in, in each instance. But, um, you know, um, over the years, we've been just steadily building up a file of client photos, um, some better than others, but, um, you know, even the ones that aren't great are still authentic. Um, and there can be some power in that authenticity. Um, and I almost wonder sometimes if clients seeing some of those photos um, it feels a little more real to them because it doesn't feel like we sent in a, you know, a, a photography crew to get a, an advertisement photo of something that isn't really real. It feels like, um, you know, it's coming from a fellow potential buyer. Um, and so I, you know, even, even the not great photos can be of value to us as we're trying to, to share images of our artwork. Uh, but, you know, it's just something we're persistent at and keep building over time and that, that, um, file builds up and becomes more and more valuable over time. Uh, let's take a question from Roseanne. And Roseanne asks, let's get it up here. And oh, Roseanne, I think I've got you here too. Um, uh, maybe I'll, rather than bringing you up, let's just talk about yours. And your question is, okay, what about, especially this year, um, sales are a little bit strange, right? Um, and, and not coming in as steadily as we might like them to. So talk to us a little bit about uh, what you're seeing. Okay, um, thanks. I, um, I've had some luck this year with um, my personal promotions, uh, especially social media and my business page and um, some uh, um, virtual events and things that I've been doing. And um, that's working out pretty well, but I have had no sales from my galleries this year. And I'm wondering if there's something I need to do. I, I only have three, I had four. One of them had uh, closed their doors this year and I have been pursuing some other ones, but I haven't really pushed that hard. I've been uh, doing my own events. Anyway, I'm not sure as a gallery owner, how do, can I, should I approach them to help them? Uh, one of them had talked about doing a solo show for me this year. Um, the other ones do some promotions from time to time. And I thought, well, maybe I can throw out my own ideas of things that I'm doing yeah. postcards I have. I'm, I just, I don't want to be a pest, but I want to be helpful if I can be. It, and exactly. Like to, and that uh, attitude is the perfect attitude. Um, I'm not contacting you to tell you how to run your business, you know, or tell you what you should do to promote your artist. But here are some things that I've done that have been really helpful. And if you were interested in partnering with me and, and doing something like this, 
Um, it, you know, that, in essence, that's going to be the message that we're trying to send. And what I might suggest is that um, you reach out to those galleries and you just share a little bit of story with them. Um, you know, I've done a few things this year that have been, um, you, you know, in, st in spite of everything that's going on, that have drawn a lot of attention to my work and have, have led to some sales. Um, and I would love to do something like this with you. Um, and you might, uh, if you've got um, kind of some of the promotional materials that you sent out to promote your own events, if you recorded the virtual event, um, you know, you could send them a link to watch. Um, they're not going to watch the whole thing, probably, but uh, they could at least hop in and kind of get a sense of what it is. And I will tell you that um, from what I'm seeing, a lot of gallery owners are going to be more open to this idea, certainly more open to this idea than they would have been a year ago. Um, and, and, and that they're um, fishing around a little bit, trying to find their own way to it. And maybe, I mean, with some, for some gallery owners, it's just that they're, they're not as, um, I have to be careful how I say it, but they're just not in the same mindset um, when it comes to virtual and digital promotion, especially galleries that have been around for a while that just haven't had to adapt quite as much until now. And so they are, um, uh, you, you know, they're looking for ways to do it. And, and now a lot of galleries and a lot of artists have heard about artists and galleries that are having success with virtual events. Um, and so they certainly might be open and might appreciate, um, you know, drawing from your knowledge um, and, and, and thinking about doing that. And so I, sure, I would go ahead and just kind of put that email out as a, hey, I just wanted to see if you'd be open to the idea of exploring doing a virtual event or um, digital promotion of, of my artwork. Here's what I've done and here are the results that I've seen and I would love to talk to you about it. Now, in other words, I just want to open the conversation and, and you know, maybe some of them won't be interested and that's fine, but you, you've at least given them the opportunity and opened that door. But I suspect that um, you would find that uh, um, you're probably going to get, a, I, I would anticipate that you get a positive response to that kind of approach. Uh, and I would love to hear um, what, what the gallery say to you as, as you kind of present to them what you've done and what's been successful for you. Uh, let's Thank go. You. Yep. Uh, and, and so we'll look forward to keeping in touch on that. Um, I've got a question from Karen. Uh, and let's see if I can get Karen up here. And Karen, if you're here and want to hop in, oops, i share the wrong thing there. Uh, Karen says, in my studio gallery, I usually focus on placing artwork um, with appreciative collectors. So it was a little tricky to know how to handle the afterlife of a painting once that collector passes away. Uh, usually work is passed along to and valued by family, and I'm grateful for that. However, one of my avid collectors passed away recently, and his widow called me expressing that she was overwhelmed by the hundreds of pieces in her home, by dozens of artists. She unfortunately had less connection to these paintings and was trying to streamline um, since she's quite elderly, too, and she only has one child. She wondered if I could advise her about the state of the art market and how to resell. How do you handle the secondary market, especially sales of artwork uh, that you originally placed? Do you ever buy them back or take them on consignment? And how do you handle the question of a commission? So, uh, boy, you know, this is a big topic. It's one that um, certainly all of us, again, are going to run into over time. Um, galleries, for sure. You know, we've now been... Um, uh, Xanadu has, is headed towards uh, 20 years of being in business. So clients that I've been selling to over the last 20 years um, are going to be entering into this state, um, you know, or downsizing, even if it's not a, 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 a passing of a client, it could be as simple as that. Um, what, what I found is that um, uh, our clients don't necessarily um, expect that we would be buying artwork back or reselling. Um, they know that we're a retail business. And, um, you know, would you expect that someone who sold you furniture um, or clothing would be buying that back? And, and, you know, once you're done with it, no, you wouldn't. And, and so there's this kind of understanding. And I, I would expect this to be the case um, 
most of the time when a client's interacting with an artist as well, that they're not necessarily expecting you to step in and take care of this problem for them. Um, but it's not a bad idea to be ready for it when it comes up. And um, if you can have some resources available to give to them, to send them in the right direction, that can be helpful as well. Um, for us, what we've done is um, we've done a little bit of research to find venues in uh, our area that specialize in reselling artwork. Um, we had for a time, one of the, the most, the, kind of one of the best resources that we could provide was we had an auction house locally that, that had a, a whole, every month they would do an auction of artwork. Um, and, and so we could send them to their specialist and um, that was a good resource for them. And we know of some clients who successfully divested themselves of some artwork that way. Um, unfortunately, that auction had a little bit of a shady owner and went, went in the wrong direction is no longer there. But um, there are some galleries and, and other venues here that um, focus on resales where we can send the clients to them. Um, you know, and, and so that, that's typically what we end up doing. Um, I, I'm really not in the business in, in the secondary market. Um, and, and frankly, even if I'm representing the artist um, whose work you're trying to, to sell, it's unlikely that I'm going to want to resell your artwork simply because um, th that really doesn't benefit the artist. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in most cases, I want to be focusing on selling current artwork coming out of the artist studio. You know, I, I, I guess I will um, be put to the test over the years as I get more and more of those kinds of situations. Um, but if you can kind of just do some, some research and find some venues that focus on resales and, and provide those, hopefully that helps your clients feel like you care. Um, and that you want to help them and that you're providing them useful information. Um, the, the other thing that we, we will sometimes recommend is that um, a client consider and talk to their accountant about the implications of donating that artwork to charitable events or, or those kinds of things. And, and some clients can get some um, significant benefits by doing that um, and, and just considering that as, as a source. Now, I will say that... Um, you know, there are some galleries uh, here in Scottsdale and um, certainly in Santa Fe and, and Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where they built an entire kind of second business around hosting their own auctions of artwork that they had previously sold. Um, uh, and, and um, you know, th that, that's kind of an interesting model. Most of the ones I'm aware of here are kind of more in the Western and Southwestern genre because that's our focus. Um, in this area, but, um, uh, you know, certainly there are going to be some opportunities for a well-known artist if, if a client is trying to divest themselves of that work um, to, to sell it at auction and maybe even realize some gain in the artwork. Um, as an artist, though, you should not feel overly um, uh, obligated, you, you know, certainly not to buy back artwork unless it's a piece you want to have back. If you feel like you could buy it um, and then sell it through a gallery or you want to have it in your own collection. But um, otherwise, try and be helpful. But, but um, you, you know, at the end of the day, you might just have to say, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry I'm not able to provide additional assistance here. Um, you, you know, I'm focused on um, producing and creating artwork and getting it out to galleries. And I just don't have an avenue for, for reselling artwork. Now, Karen, if there's a specific, you know, if that conversation with this particular client has um, advanced from where it was in your email and um, you'd like to talk a little bit more about that, hit me up with an email. We can talk about kind of the diplomatic way to say that um, so that the client doesn't leave having negative feelings about you and uh, your artwork. Uh, a question from Jane. And uh, Jane, I'm not sure, are you here? Let's, let's pull you up. Um, and this question is, I've been working on some uh, new portfolios, but I'm finding them when I try to turn PowerPoint into PDF. Uh, the formerly free use of a service is limited to smaller files. I've been using smallpdf.com 
Um, are there other providers out there, their service is good, but I want to check out uh, any other options before committing financially, since I really have a, a very limited need, albeit important when I need it. So let me take that. Uh, well, the second part is the other question is uh, what online services are best for printing uh, copies of bios and portfolios? So a couple of the good um, technical questions for us. Um, and, and for those of you who haven't gotten to the digital portfolio yet, what Jane's referring to is um, when we create a PDF of the portfolio that we're going to send out to galleries, we need to make sure that it's not um, inbox crushing huge file. You know, we do not need to have um, print quality images going through the email to the, to the galleries. Um, a lot of times um, files that big would just bounce back to us. And so we need to make sure um, Gmail's limit right now is uh, 25 megabytes, I think. Um, and some of the services are 20. So we want to have something that's in the 10 to 15 megabytes at most size. Um, and so that being the case, a lot of times the PDF that you're going to get out of a PowerPoint or um, Google Slides or whatever service you're using to put together your portfolio might end up being larger than that. Um, and so in the lesson, I recommend, I think it is small PDF that I recommend, where they'll take your um, PDF, process it for you, um, and provide it back to you at a compressed size that makes it easier to send. And unfortunately, um, and of course, we can understand the motivation for this happening is that a lot of these services give you a limited, um, kind of a limited uh, program or a limited option to do it. But for anything more than that, they want to charge you for it. Um, obviously, they're, they're, they're trying to generate revenue from, from the service. Um, and, and, you know, it is almost inevitable that we're going to run into that with most services. What I will say is this, that if you, um, we use the, uh, we have the Adobe Creative Cloud. So we have actually Acrobat and can um, do compression natively in Acrobat. And if you've got a file that's um, giving you grief, you're having a hard time figuring out how to compress it down, just email it to me and I'll have my team compress it for you and send it back to you. It takes us all of 37 seconds to, to, to run a PDF through and compress it to a, a, uh, a size that, that's usable. And we're very happy to do that. If, you, if small PDF isn't working for you or one of the other online services, um, just shoot it over to us and, and we'll send it back to you and, and um, uh, you know, hopefully it would even be at a little bit better quality. Of course, that does raise Jason, the challenge. Thank, that if it's Jason, too big, thanks for that. Yeah, go um, ahead, Jane. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that um, it's like getting PowerPoint and um, Word uh, documents that are, well, I think the PowerPoint portfolio was something when I finished it, I had done it for printing and it was something like 70 megabytes and yeah. so yeah and i would never uh, i appreciate your offer i would never be able to email something like that however what i did like about small pdf is they could take any kind of file you have and fix it now i wasn't sure about adobe creative cloud that takes I do have Adobe, I don't have that level of it, but um, that will take a, a PowerPoint and uh, change it to a PDF? Well, what you would actually do is you would, in PowerPoint, you would save as a PDF. So you're working oh. with a PDF file, oh. then you can open it in Acrobat oh. and save a copy at the compressed, oh. uh, you know, save for web or save as compressed. And let, it would let you process that that PDF in Acrobat, but you do have to have, um, you know, a version of Creative Cloud or Adobe that includes Acrobat, um, and that's probably that's way more expensive than than just you than, you know paying yeah. dollars to small PDF. Oh, okay, well, I'm having my dull moment. I never thought to save it as something different, you know, to yeah. get it compressed. So okay, well that helps me out a whole lot. I'll just I'll just. Go yeah, with that. yeah, and like I say, um, you know, if you run into a hiccup like that, don't let that become a stumbling block for getting uh -huh. things done. Hit me with an email, um, and okay. uh, myself or my team will have resources for you that can help kind of guide through step okay. by step. Um, and we can even have tell you, you know, if it's too big to email to us, we can tell you how to use a Dropbox or a okay. Google Drive uh -huh. to save and share it with us, and we can kind of uh -huh. help you through that process.
process. Okay, so thank very you. Very happy to the, do something like okay. that. Okay. The the other no. thing was about the the printing because I thought I eventually wanted to print out um, my biography, which is four pages. There'll be it'll be just be a fold over. Sure. Um, I've I've done this with um, using staples, but I really wanted to do something online. So how? Yeah. What, what service is that? Yeah, I mean, I will tell you, we do use staples and Office Maxes um, uh -huh. print houses um, to do uh -huh. some of this kind of stuff. You know, sometimes it's it's a, a balance between the convenience and the quality, and, and just kind of figuring uh -huh. out what's most important. Um, we've used um, MagCloud for mm -hmm. online printing. Okay. Um, we've used Book Baby. Um, the, 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 I'm trying to think. There are a couple of others that we've used over time. Okay. And and then the other one I might recommend is PSPrint.com, um, okay. and they have more products available: um, brochures, folders, um, booklets, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Um, and, and are pretty reasonably priced and let you print small mm -hmm. runs of them. Uh, that, mm -hmm. you know, the problem with some print houses is the minimum order is mm -hmm. a thousand or something mm -hmm. like that. And you don't need that mm -hmm. many. Um, mm -hmm. So you want to look for someone who will let you do kind of more small runs. So I, I would start actually with PS print um, okay. and, and look at the, the different options that, that they provide. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep, you bet. All right, let's see if I can get a couple more in here. This one from Melanie, and Melanie asks, uh, here we go. Um, when working in a series, my particular gallery wants me to stay with a color palette range. Right now, cool tones for this particular series. So the work can hang together cohesively, but as I branch out to seek other gallery representation, is it wise to choose another color palette such as warm tones? Um, and so, Melanie, you're doing um, something that uh, we, we've talked about quite a bit here um, and, and that is very natural, um, but that is to um, start to try and second guess the market. Um, you know, what are people going to be interested in? Um, and, um, you know, should I be moving in a different direction than what I'm moving in right now? And, and I would just caution against that approach. Um, now that's not to say there can't be value in experimenting with some different palettes, but, but come at that from an artistic and aesthetic standpoint, not from a marketing standpoint. Um, you know, if you're saying, I would really like to try creating some artwork in, in warm tones because it interests me and I wanna see what the work would look like and what directions it would take me. And so I'm gonna, gonna create a series in these warm tones um, because as soon as you say, um, well, I think clients and, and current decorating trends and galleries, as soon as you start thinking in that way and start thinking about, well, it's more likely to sell, that's when you start running into creating work that um, tends to pile up and, and not be as successful for you. Um, you, you know, could I look at the art market and say, well, artwork in warm tones tends to sell better than artwork in cool tones? Maybe I could. Um, but, but it is just such a broad, diverse art market that, uh, again, I maintain that what you're excited about creating and, and by being cohesive in creating it um, and, and then going out and finding a market that is also interested in that work, that's going to be more successful for you. And I have, um, you know, again, in my gallery, um, you would see artists across the spectrum in terms of um, uh, you, you know, color temperature and, and um, the palettes that they're using. Um, and some of my most successful artists, um, last year, in fact, my second best-selling artist in Scottsdale is an artist who does work that is very much in the um, cooler jewel tones, blues and, and purples and, and um, you, you know, uh, darker colors, um, not warm at all, um, but, but has done very well for me. If, um, not necessarily because it's cool, but, but because she's cohesive and consistent. And when clients find it and it's going to fit into what they're doing, um, you know, they're highly likely to buy it. And, and if you kind of were to look at the big picture and think about, okay, there's a lot more artwork out there in warm tones or yellows or whatever it is, um, you know, those clients who are not interested in those tones, who need something that's cool, 
have a narrower range of artists to select from, and therefore your artwork has a better potential of, of resonating with them. Um, and so, you know, there are advantages and, and disadvantages to, to, to all that. And so again, I just say, don't second guess. Do the work that um, you're creatively invigorated by, that you're passionate about, and um, your galleries are going to, to be able to find the clientele for that work. Um, and be more successful at it. And I would especially be careful, you know, if you're if you're thinking about trying something new and it's significantly different than your core body of work that you've been creating for years, and it's going to to create, you know, a very different field. That I would be very cautious about that because you can quickly get caught with a mix of work that doesn't really work together. That you have to think about marketing separately that different galleries are going to be interested in and and it just very much is going to complicate your life in ways that we do not need your life to be complicated it is complicated enough um, as it is and so let's try and keep things simple don't second guess the market do what you're excited about uh, anyone want to hop in with a comment on that or what you find with your own work as you're thinking about creating pieces? I mean, we've got a few minutes left here. Um, anyone want to argue with me about it or uh, uh, get in another point? All right. If not, let's jump to, uh, I think I have time for another question or two here. Uh, this question from Kathleen. My question is about location. I know for an art gallery, location is very important. So I was wondering how important do you think living close to an art destination is? Um, yes, interesting question. And, and Kathleen, I guess I would need to, to dive in a little deeper with you on this and, and um, ask you, are you thinking about moving? Um, you know, are, are you, you looking for a new, new place to set up a studio and home? Um, I suspect not. Um, usually when I see a question like this, it is a um, more of a, uh, I'm having a hard time getting into galleries. I'm having a hard time selling my artwork. Is it because I live in the wrong place and should I give up? To which I respond um, emphatically, no, don't give up. Um, and you do not need to live in an art mecca in order to create sales. I'll remind you that... Um, you know, I grew up in a, in a household where my father was trying to make a living as an artist, um, and we lived in a town of about 8,000 people in the middle of Idaho farm country that was just as far as you could get from, um, you know, any, any kind of art thing going on. I mean, I guess we were, um, you know, a couple hours away from Sun Valley, Idaho, but, but, but uh, that was the closest you could get, and, and, and you know, in spite of that, uh, my father's been able to build, build a very successful career by reaching out to galleries across the country. And, um, you know, um, are you going to have some challenges in terms of um, the logistics of getting to galleries and getting your artwork to galleries? Yes. Um, but, but there are some offsets to that in, in the sense that it's likely, um, you know, if you're not in an art mecca, or a vacation destination or an art destination. Um, you know, typical of those art destinations is that they are in areas that are more expensive to live. The cost of living is gonna be higher. Um, and, and so, you know, the amount you have to sell in order to sustain your livelihood is going to be higher. And, and so there, you know, you can take advantage of whatever situation you happen to be in. And I would not be thinking about there are, are many things I would think about doing before I would ever consider packing up my studio and moving um, in order to solve those kinds of problems. Um, you know, with the internet and with the, um, uh, well, at least former, for, former ease of traveling, um, an artist, no matter where they lived, could have access to great art markets um, with, with just a little bit of effort. And, and that's where I would put my focus is on um, accessing the markets they can and, and then just working through the logistics. And I, you know, I know a lot of artists. In fact, I've just been having a conversation with one of the artists that I represent um, who's just getting ready to, he's just put his home on the market. He and his wife put their home on the market and they're getting ready to move to a pretty remote location. Um, you know, they've had it with uh, the, the, the craziness of the area that they live in and, and uh, some of the things that are going on there. And, um, 
you know, he can have his studio anywhere and he's getting ready to move away from um, uh, really what could be considered an art market. Um, and, and I know a lot of artists who live in very remote locations and make it work very successfully. So um, let's, let, let's focus on, um, you know, getting our work out there and what we can do to build relationships and get over logistical challenges rather than, um, you, you know, thinking about making a major uh, transition if it's not already in the works anyway. Um, we've done it. Um, I've not gotten to nearly all of your questions, uh, but don't worry. Uh, we will have other opportunities to make sure we get to those. If you send in a question um, that has some urgency to it um, and you need a response um, before we're going to have a chance to get to our next Q&A, um, follow up with me in an email and um, you, you know, make sure you emphasize, hey, Jason, if you, when you just have a second, could you respond to this? Otherwise, go ahead and resend it the next time we do a Q&A and, and uh, eventually we will get to all of your questions. Um, next week, um, my kids, although it's a little weird to say it because we're basically on a constant state of break, um, you know, they're working from school at home and, and uh, on their computers, but next week is uh, my daughter's fall break. Um, and so it is possible that we're going to be doing a quick day trip and it might fall on Friday. We haven't quite figured out the timing. If that happens, you're going to get an email from me next week saying that there's no broadcast. Um, it could go one way or the other. So just be, be prepared for that. Um, if, if that doesn't happen on Friday, we will be back here uh, next Friday morning. Otherwise, it would be two weeks from now. Um, but we'll look forward to uh, uh, being in touch. You can eat, reach me at any time and I'll be keeping up on my email. Um, even though it's been a little crazy this last week and I'm maybe a day slower than normal, I will definitely get back to you.